So uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Sasha Kiselev, uh, who uh, got his PhD from uh, Caltech University in 1997. Uh, after that, he has held different uh, position uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, Rice University, and uh, lastly, uh, he's a full professor at Duke University. He is a famous expert on uh, analysis in PDE in his broad sense and uh, made a lot of contribution, contributions. And in particular, he has uh, uh, obtained the Guggenheim uh, Fellowship. And uh, he has been also uh, invited speaker at the ICM in 2018. It's my great pleasure now to let Sasha talk about uh, the flow of polynomials of polynomial roots under differentiation. So please, Sasha. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to speak here. And so what, what I will be going to, to talk about is a little bit of a departure from my usual line of research, but I very much enjoyed working on this subject. It connects somewhat unexpected unexpectedly different areas so so it was an interesting um, interesting project everything i'm going to talk about is joint work with chan hui tan okay sir uh, my name okay can you hear me Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, so what happens with roots of polynomials of entire functions, roots of polynomials or entire functions under differentiation is, is a classical problem. And it goes back to Gauss and Lucas work in 1860s, 60s, 70s. And it's, it's a well-known result that the roots of derivative of a polynomial line convex hull of the zeros of the polynomial. And then a little bit later, there were a series of famous conjectures by Pole and women uh, about behavior of roots of some entire functions under differentiation, some of which were solved and others not quite. But closest to what I'm going to talk about is work by Marcel Reitz in 1920s. Um, and basically what he showed is that if you take uh, just the real um, polynomial with, with real valued coefficients, uh, the uh, some high degree, then the, the smallest gap between roots tends to grow under differentiation. So there is a sort of kind of equilibration and uh, the, the, the term used in the area sometimes is crystallization that roots of high order derivatives align along ideal lattice after some number of differentiations. And, and so this has been conjectured for some classes of entire functions. Of course, for entire functions, you can differentiate as many times as you want without, no, no, without function becoming trivial. And it was proved for some random classes by Mantel and Sebramian and certain random polynomials. <clears throat> um, let's see, I think we have difficulty there. All right, that's good. There is an interesting connection also to quantum theory. Uh, Michael Berry pointed out that in some cases, this sort of universal uh, nature of oscillations and high order derivatives is connected to quantum phenomena. <clears throat> And so I actually learned about this problem from Stefan Steinerberger a few years ago. And uh, Stefan formally derived the PDE that uh, should control evolution of roots under differentiation, uh, at least in some regimes. So, so here we're thinking about um, his initial setting. He had a polynomial on the real line of large degree and roots are distributed uh, according to some smooth density. So the, the work was formal. It means that it, it sort of, there was no precise definition, but 
uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the, the setting is that we want to understand zeros of, of derivatives where the, the order of, of differentiation is of, of the order n, like the degree of polynomial, and time is between zero and one. Because you know, if you go beyond one, everything is trivial, right? So polynomial just becomes trivial. And so the PDE that he has derived has this form here. And uh, there are two equivalent formulations. Uh, lambda here is a Laplacian one half, and it appears because a derivative of the Hilbert transform H is exactly lambda. And so it's, it's a PDE of hydrodynamic type. And basically the, 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 the prediction is that <clears throat> one differentiation is like one over n step in time. So if we look at the, the roots of pk where k is tn, k differentiations, then the roots should be distributed according to the solution of this PDE at time t. If we start with initial data u0, which corresponds to initial distribution of roots. Okay, so I will sketch this formal derivation a little bit later. And so now I want to talk about some connections, which are some of them are, I think are sort of interesting for this PD. It seems to appear in, in, in different situations. It's very young, just four years old, but it has suddenly shown up in different places. And so I actually don't know too much about some of the things that I'm going to say, but maybe some of you do, it may be interesting for some of you. And so same, same PDE was formally derived by Schlechtenko and Tau as evolution equation for free fractional convolution of a probability measure. So what is free fractional convolution? It's an object that appears in non-commutative, um, in, in, in free probability, non-commutative non probability theory. And so it appears as a law of the sum of two freely independent non-commutative random variables. Okay, so, so I, I will not go too deeply in it, but it's, it, it, it's basically similar like, like to, to add, when you add two, two random variables, then the law of the sum is the usual convolution of their laws. And that's the analogous object that appears in free probability. And one can define actually also fractional uh, convolution uh, sort of like you can define just raise characteristic function to some fractional power and, and try to see what, what probability law you get out of that. But actually the existence of this free fractional convolution and free probability theory is, has, has been proved just, just recently. So it's not so, not so simple. And, and objects like this appear, for instance, when you're trying to prove central limit theorem in the usual probability and its free pro probability analog. Which, which looks a bit different here. You don't get Gaussian free probability, but rather something that's called Wigner semicircle law. And so in this setting of free fractional convolution, it's, it's the variable one minus one over K, where K is, is this order of the convolution that plays the role of time. And so this, this formal derivation by Schlechtenko and Tau actually uses complex structure of the problem and uh, th this, this is actually something that we, we didn't use in our work and po po it's possible that that's sort of uh, actually useful information. And it's the Cauchy transform of this U, the solution of the PD, obeys a, a complex Burgers equation, Burgers type equation um, in the upper half plane. And we are sort of working on the boundary with our, with, with, the, with the Stein Burgers P. <clears throat> So that there is this interesting connection. There is also related work by Hoskins and Kabluchko, um, and they have a different way of thinking about this problem. They have a different way to compute the distribution of roots of the derivatives of order n. Th th their way applies in the limit n goes to infinity, so it sort of addresses limiting distribution. And um, they also rigorously connect differentiation of polynomials on free fractional convolution. Um, and, and so uh, the result applies at each time, but in the limit n goes to infinity. So, so it's a little bit 
little bit different kind of, of result. Uh, the connection to PDE has been established rigorously uh, or only in a setting with complex polynomial radial distribution of roots. It's, it's a little bit different PDE uh, that I, I will not focus on. It's a PDE derived by Rurke and Steinerberger a little bit later, and it, it's, a, it's a simpler, the non-locality in that PDE is simple. <clears throat> and so there is also connection of all this, as, as one can guess from the connection to free probability, there is a link to random matrix theory. So the Steinerberger SPD is conjectured to describe evolution of uh, probability density of eigenvalue distribution of random matrices under something called minor process. So it's, it's creating minor of ensemble of matrices. You are dropping lines and, and columns. And so you kind of shrink shrink this matrix for some for some large size ensemble. And so th th this is actually known to be connected with the differentiation of, of uh, characteristic polynomials or, or like rank one operations are, are, are similar to differentiation in that sense. And so, so this is kind of an overview of various connections and um, uh, what we will do is we just focus on the PDE and, and try to understand the PDE and, and try to understand, is it indeed related to uh, differentiation of roots and, and in what sense? <clears throat> and so our setting is going to be periodic. So we'll look at trigonometric polynomials and we will assume that this, this class we will work with has the following form. So there are exactly um, two n roots. Just it, it's, it's a trigonometric polynomial of order n, and we assume it can be represented as just product of, of signs. Um, and so initially they are distributed according to some smooth density. I'll make it more precise later what, what is meant by this. And so one observation is that in this setting, the process of crystallization, one can understand on elementary level. So if, if we will differentiate this trigonometric polynomial, each time there is a factor of n that will jump out of the most senior term. And from, from other terms, there will be a smaller factor coming out. So if we differentiate n times, the, the leading terms will gain a constant factor over, over the next, next term. And so as we take the number of differentiations to infinity, basically we get the, the leading contribution comes just from, from the most senior terms. And then we would expect the roots to align according to ideal lattice. That's what sine or cosine gives us. Of course, how it happens and whether the the you know the time scale is n, it looks like it's likely, but if, if our starting object is a smooth density, then these coefficients here would also conceivably depend on n. And so so it's it's not completely clear um, how it happens and sort of what are the right time scales. But th this crystallization is, is very natural. One can just see that. And so now let me sketch the derivation of, of the PDE, the, the formal derivation. It's just an analog of Steinerberger's argument. It's, it's really similar in periodic setting. So if we are starting from this polynomial, which is a product of signs, we take a derivative. This is what we get for a derivative. And it's the sum of these cotangent functions that will decide where the roots are. And the roots are interlaced. So between two roots of the initial polynomial, there will be a root of the derivative. And now let's split the sum of cotangents into two parts. <clears throat> the short range part close to the root, like let, let's fix one root. Between, between two roots of the original polynomial and look near, near that root. 
So this is the close range and this is the far range. <clears throat> and so first for the close range, let's replace cotangent with, with just two over. <clears throat> okay, so this is the main leading term approximation of these cotangents. And of course there is an error, but it's a formal derivation. So we'll ignore the error. Now, since the summation range is small, right? We are, we are looking really near this root that we are trying to determine. We'll replace the xj's, the roots of the original polynomial in the sum by ideal lattice. So the roots are distributed according to some smooth density. And so near this point, this density has a value. And because the, the range is really short, we, think this value doesn't change that much. And we'll replace it just by ideal lattice. And now we're going to turn the sum back into cotangent using cotangent identity, right? So this is um, the, the equality that expresses cotangent in terms of, of this uh, fraction, sum of these fractions. And and now then the sum, if we replace everything by the lattice, uh, it's gonna be <clears throat> very similar to what appears in cotangent, except we cut off the sum at some point, right? Because of this, this condition. But uh, after rescaling, because, because our roots come at, at the distance one over n, right? There are two n roots that we start with. So that's the order of distance between the roots. The limits, <clears throat> the sum are large, and we pretend that they're infinite. So to use cotangent identity. And so the short range sum can be turned into this cotangent where the difference between the new root and the old root appears in the argument of the cotangent. <clears throat> so that's the short term part. And then for the far field, <laughs> we are going to just say that the sum is approximated by an integral. And this integral is precisely um, the, the Hilbert transform of the density, right? So, so the roots are spaced according to the density and that's why density appears in this integral, right? The distance between roots is roughly um, one over or one over two n time, times the density. That's intuitive meaning of the density since it's formal argument, we just, go with that. And so putting together, like we have to ignore many errors, right? So I think the like four errors we had to just ignore. But if we look at the main order terms, then we get the following balance equation. And this gives us microscopic flux of the roots. And that's, that's here, our tangent appears. And this microscopic flux exactly corresponds to to the steiner bergers equation. <clears throat> okay. So that's, that's uh, basically the, the original argument. <clears throat> of course, to make it more rigorous, one really has to handle the errors. And, and that's something that I will mention a little bit later. And so first question that we worked on for the Steiner-Bergers PDE is global regularity, right? So just let's first try to understand the PDE. And so this PDE, which appears here, has been studied before, and it's actually similar to Steiner-Bergers PDE. So the difference of Steiner-Bergers PDE is that there is also a denominator for these last two terms which has u squared plus h u squared. So there's there's denominator there. <clears throat> but this PD here has been studied and actually it has been quite popular. There are several different settings where it appeared. Uh, I think the first instance was in 1972 where it was proposed as a model of dislocation theory. It's actually quite amazing how, how um, kind of it's in how many instances this appears as a simplified model. 
And I think at that point, there was a focus on some special solutions. Then it appeared as a model of porous media flow in a series of works of Caffarelli and Vasquez. And the main result there was herd regularity of weak solutions. And then it appeared <coughs> as a, in the context of collective behavior, so-called Euler alignment model in the work of Schwitko and Tadmor. And they proved global regularity for the case where U is strictly positive. So like in a periodic case, U is away from zero. So if, if U vanishes, this depletes the, the dissipation in the equation. And that's where one does not expect more than Hölder regularity that was established by Caffarelli and Vasquez. <clears throat> then it also was studied as a simplified model of the SQG equation, I think without U, so with, with non-degenerate diffusion. And finally, granero Belinchon proved local well posedness in H2 and global regularity for small data for the steiner berger's equation already. So not this equation, but with the denominator. So that's what, <clears throat> what was known before our work. And so let me state our first results. So here I rewrite the, the PD again. <clears throat> Excuse me just a second. So this is global regularity result. <clears throat> um, we prove that if initial data is sufficiently regular, in HS with S greater than three over two, then periodic initial data, which are positive, lead to global smooth solution. Moreover, the solution converges exponentially to the mean and all derivatives decay exponentially. And the exponential rate only depends on the mean of the solution. So it's, it's, it's really robust, this exponential decay. So what is surprising, um, somewhat surprising for us uh, here is that this equation is, is extremely good. Kind of, if we replaced it with a heat equation, we couldn't say more, right? So it's a nonlinear equation, but it, it has very nice, regularity problems. And by the way, I should say that this constraint has been um, improved and, and it's known for S greater or equal than one and a half in, in work of Lazar, Lazar and Guin. Um, and I don't remember Omar, do you include one and a half or not? Uh, yes, yes, just for okay. the existence, but not uniqueness. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so that's <clears throat> that's the first result. Um, and so, first of all, the local well poisonous is more or less standard. It was also proved by Granero Belinchon. And so, locally, we have actually a nice solution. It it even improves regularity since there is this. Uh, dissipative uh, part. Um, and so there is also the, the, the Bill Cato-Maida uh, kind of criterion for this equation, which says that if you control the derivative of the solution, then you control everything. There is also maximum principle. So the solution, if it's initially between, uh, between some values, Sandwich between some values, it stays in this in this range. So this is local, but global regularity is a little bit more uh, sophisticated. And global regularity for equations of this type, there have been several approaches that have been developed uh, for, for 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 this PD and. Uh, Nazarov, Wolberg, and myself developed modules of continuity method that were applied to critical SQG. And Caffarelli Vasseur used D. Georgi type techniques for the same problem to establish global regularity. And then Konstantin Vikol developed what they call nonlinear maximum principle for that purpose. 
And there is also work of Sylvester and, and it's Schwab and Sylvester that's also related to this, this class of PDEs. And so we, we actually used the modules of continuity method and the, the modules that we used is shown here. It's actually Lipschitz and, and it has some very slow growth at infinity. So what we prove with that solutions of the SPD can serve these modules. Um, and actually due to scaling, they will also conserve any, any scaled modules like that. An alternative approach has, has recently been uh, proposed by Schwitkoi, and, and he gave a very elegant argument, uh, reducing global regularity to Sylvester's result. This is done by looking at the equation for Hilbert transform U over U. Turns out to satisfy maximum principle, so this can be used to, to reduce to, to Sylvester's general results for, for for this type of equation. <clears throat> so, but let me say, talk about the modulus method. Um, it's it's self-contained, but we have to improve it over over the kind of applications that have been done before. <clears throat> and so let, let me recall the um, sort of the idea and the overall structure of the method. First of all, as I already mentioned, if we show that some modulus is conserved for arbitrary period, that would imply also conservation of any scale modulus. And, and that would allow us to control any initial data. <clears throat> as far as modulus goes at infinity. So then given any smooth initial data, we can squeeze the modulus strongly enough so that the initial data will satisfy. And then if it's cons conserved, this will give the bound on the gradient of, of the solution that will be valid for, for all times. <laughs> and so to show that the modulus is conserved, we we'll look at breakthrough scenario, and it's a scenario when solution tries to touch the modulus. It's the first time where where it tries to break through, and one can show that for the modules that we have, it can only happen at two distinct points. So, so at two distinct points and some first time you have this equality, and then the goal is to prove that okay, in this case, the solution cannot break through. So the derivative of difference is actually negative. So, so in reality, it can, it can never touch. And so um, this is done by controlling the uh, flow and the dissipative term. So the term with lambda is, is dissipative and with Hilbert transform, that's, that's the transport part. And um, so the estimate of the transport part goes through uh, estimating the, 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 the modulus of continuity of the Hilbert transform. And roughly, it's good to think about it as the modulus, original modulus times a log. So it's, it's worse by a log. And then for the difference of the flow terms, one, one controls it by derivative of the modulus times, times the modulus for, for the Hilbert transform. And then the diffusive part, after some estimates, one can show the following form for, for the diffusive part. And the question is then the balance between these two terms. So, so this is what, how it looks for like for SQG or for this equation um, when it's, it's a bit, if, if it's a bit simpler, if there is no U in front of the dissipation and if there is no denominator. So these additional features make it a little bit trickier and so if you go through the algebra, you realize that for the flow term, the best estimate you can get has actually this capital omega squared. So a square of, of the modulus for the flow term. And for, for the dissipative term, uh, for the large C range, the estimate is omega over C. So it comes just from, from this term. Um, one can show you get like a, a portion of omega from the numerator, and then the denominator integrates to, to one over C. And so this is a bit worse than 
for for the for the known applications and uh, like short range xi like we have to show this this for every possible xi xi is a distance at which we have this first touch because we have to control all periods it can be as large arbitrary size and so in generally like large xi range is is the trickiest to control and so if if we try to to balance these two terms it turns out that we can actually cannot have the modulus that grows yeah so 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 we have um, a control from above on, on on the modulus that is a little bit too strong this is an integrable function and and so this gives just a, a small data result basically that's that's what it is if you cannot make your modulus grow and so one needs a little bit of a further analysis and basically it involves understanding why there is this extra term that we get in the flow regime. And it happens in certain scenario where Hilbert transform at one of the points where we touch is much, much larger than at the other. On the other hand, uh, the estimate for the dissipative part is sharp, but for a very specific configuration where solution is really close to the kind of modulus, which is extended in an odd fashion. And this two turn out to be incompatible. So when we are in the situation where there is an extra term in the, in the flow estimate, we also get something extra in the dissipative estimate. And so that's, that's how one can balance these terms and actually construct modulus that grows and complete global regularity. proof. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the first part. <clears throat> now the second part has been, at least for us, it has been surprising in that we, we, we tried also to, to rigorously connect the PDE and the rules, right? So there is a formal derivation, but can we make it rigorous? And so now we need to define it a little bit more precisely, what we mean by roots distributed according to a density. And basically this is done by defining an error between distribution of roots and the density. And that's how it's defined. So we have a polynomial, the original roots are xj's, the xj bars are the midpoints between the roots. And then the error is, is a difference of the roots minus this regular step that, that's predicted by density. So, you know, if the error is zero, then definitely roots are distributed according to the density. But in fact, we can be a little bit more relaxed and allow some small errors. And so for the connection theorem, xjt, by the way, here, are the roots of, of um, 2n t times differentiated um, polynomial. So as, as in Steinberg's derivation, time is order one over n. So to be precise, one, one differentiation is, is, is um, one over n, one over 2n evolution in time. And so theorem works for sufficiently smooth initial data. I think we actually need just greater or equal than three um, sobel of space. And it needs to be positive for this theorem and it's normalized. We think of it as density. And let's say P to N is any trigonometric polynomial that obeys this, this relation with errors that are sufficiently small. So it's N minus one minus epsilon order. Right, that's the deviation, deviation, the errors that we can, can afford in this theorem. And so then there exists a, a degree and zero that depends only on initial data on epsilon and on this prefactor telling us how large the errors are. So that if the degree of polynomial is greater than this n zero, then these errors in time obey the following estimate. 
So this is what we start from. Then there could be some growth, some transient growth, but the order is, is as follows. It's n minus three over two times, times time. And then there is an exponential decay in time. <clears throat> and so this is true for all times. So what was surprising to us in this theorem is that it works for all times, right? So, so the expectation going in, at least for us, was that, well, okay, this formal duration, we expect that for some time, these two processes will stay close for some finite time. Now it's true that for large times, we expect crystallization for the roots, and we expect the solution to go to the mean. So at least in the end, they should converge to the same place. But it's not clear why time scales have to be the same, why they cannot diverge quite far and then come back. And so this was a little bit of a surprise for us. And I'll, I will explain a little bit later where, where this is coming from. Is a kind of structure that we don't really understand, but um, it, it enables this uh, global time, time result. And so let me sketch the proof of this theorem. It involves carefully estimating all these errors that we've discarded in the formal derivation. And so, um, basically, if we go back to this formal derivation, then this is the main order that, that we've had here in blue, right? So this was this micro microscopic flux of, of roots. And then what we discarded was an error coming from uh, approximations we did for the close range sum of the cotangents and approximation we did for the long range sum. And so this all now appears here. So in the, in the short range, we first replaced it with just a, a series of fractions, and then we, we, we converted those series into cotangent with cotangent identity. And now we have to, to carefully treat these roots, the, 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 these errors. And then in, in the far range, we replace some uh, with an integral, and we replaced integral that we cut a little bit, uh, with a little bit part cut, cut out with, with, a, with a full range integral, right? Because we said it's, it's Hilbert transform. Mm -hmm. And so, so all these errors we now have, have to estimate. <laughs> and so the key is that we want to derive this evolution of error equation. Uh, that's what, what produces this result on the errors that, that you see in the theorem. And for that, we need to, to look at the differences of, of roots, right? Because that's how the errors are defined. And, and so differences of the errors, um, we, we, we can write in the following form. And, and now we have to, to estimate everything that appears on the right hand side. And so just to give an idea about the structure that's going to emerge is right when we look at the differences of, of these, these, these errors for, for nearby roots, uh, one term that we will use is the difference of cotangents, right? Corresponding to, to similar terms in the the sums. And uh, the, the structure that I want to, to point out is the following structure. <clears throat> so, so the difference of cotangents will approximate by the difference of the fractions. And now the blue terms are the terms that will actually be consumed by the, the PDE. So these blue terms Will, will be the main order of the evolution that is exactly reflected by the PDE. But the red terms will be something that stays in the error equation. And, and you can note 
an interesting structure of this, this term that will stay in the error equation because it, it looks like some sort of fractional differentiation, right? So we, we have ej minus m. So this is all summed in, in j. <coughs> And we have a denominator here, sort of like in a fractional Laplacian, discrete fractional Laplacian. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and so this will turn out to be kind of main terms that will appear in this um, evolution of the error. And then there are lots of, of additional error terms that we have to control. Um, and so maybe. I will, I will show you first the theorem that comes out of this, these calculations, and then I'll, I'll come back um, to, these, to these terms. So this is the theorem about the propagation of error that is stated in more detail. And basically, there is the main order term, and the operator in this main order term is essentially a fractional Laplacian of order one half, discrete fractional Laplacian. So this is the order of these coefficients in the sum. And, and these terms exactly come from these red ones. So it, it's sort of like the main order um, in the error propagation equation. And then there are lots of additional terms, lots of errors. And so the, the error terms <clears throat> that appear can be classified as supercritical, critical, and subcritical. And uh, so why do I call them like this? So this is here an example of supercritical term. Um, why is it supercritical? Well, if we throw in just absolute values on this term, then uh, what we will get is n minus one log n of L infinity sort of bound on the error. And so if we iterate it n times, because we are taking n, n differentiations, this, this will become actually very large. Okay, so, so in, the, in the evolution of errors that would blow up over n iterations and, and, and an error term like this. And so supercritical terms, what the way we estimate them is we consume them into the main of Term. We, we, we use the main term to control these. Um, and so uh, basically, we use cancellations under the sum because here this cotangent is, is, is an odd function. So, so there will be cancellations here. We just subtract the emth uh, error in this sum. And then it turns out that this can be added as, as a minor term into the main order dissipative term. <clears throat> and so this, on the other hand, if we, if we subtract this, th this can be absorbed by the dissipation, but the price we pay for subtracting this error EM will be a better error because of the sign cancellations that we have here. Like EJs, we don't really control how, what they do. Maybe they conspire to also have the sign that, that will destroy any, any benefit from the oddness, but this is a fixed term. And now, now we can um, take advantage of the cancellations. <clears throat> and so there are also many order errors that are of the order n minus one or forcing terms that don't depend on E and, and largest forcing terms are n minus five over two. So these kind of terms, would allow a finite time result, fixed finite time result, but not global in time result. What saves the day is it turns out that all these critical errors have factors of derivatives, u prime or, or high order derivatives in front of them. And we know that these derivatives decay exponentially. So in fact, these, these critical order terms, they, um, decay in time. And so that, that's, that's why we are able to propagate for them uh, for infinite time. <clears throat> and so again, this is the theorem that we arrive, arrive at. These diffusion coefficients in the dissipative part 
they they have this this main order dissipative structure, which really comes from something like a resolvent identity, right? So so this dissipative structure is there, and and all supercritical errors are in there. So that's the, the form of the diffusion coefficients. So this main order term is exactly from from that red term a few slides back, and these are all supercritical terms that have been eaten by by, by it. And then there are critical errors with this delta. So delta is, 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 has derivatives of u in it, and this decays exponentially. And then there are subcritical terms, there are lots of them, but these terms are kind of lower order and they, don't, they are not dangerous for infinite time propagation. And so we don't really have a good understanding why this structure appears, this sort of dissipative structure in the error equation. Uh, it was a major surprise for us that we were able to isolate this dissipative part, but that's exactly what allows us to, to, to go on for, for infinite time. And so one more uh, thing maybe I should say a little bit about is that this dissipative operator does not have much effect on the mean Right, so the, it doesn't affect the mean. So you may be worried that maybe maybe something funny happens with the mean, but in fact that's not the case because there is a, a conservation. The, the 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 integral of u is is conserved, and and then you can get a sort of Poincaré type constraint for the errors out of this uh, conservation, and so so that allows you to 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 basically that get this exponential decay now that appears in, in, the, in the first theorem on the connection between PDE and, 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 and uh, dynamics of rules. Okay, so, so that's the, the connection theorem. And um, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the results. I think that the interesting question is whether you can generalize it a little bit. So what we have is right, the connection between roots and the PE works for the initial root configurations that are, are relatively are fairly regular on the small scale. Right, so the spacing should be one over n according to the density with errors that are of, of, the, of the smaller order. It's very natural uh, from the point of view of the argument to have these errors of smaller order, right? I mean, it, but, but on the other hand, uh, the, the variations on the, on the unit scale can be quite large, but let's say if we wanted to apply it to some random ensemble, most random ensembles do allow fluctuations that could be of, of larger order than this one. And so it would be interesting to extend it to this case, but it's sort of like for PDE, it would be the same as dealing with very rough data. Like if, if, you're, if, you're, if your density could jump, right? So that would be like order of one over n fluctuation. And and that is that is very rough, right? So it's uh, it's it's it, it misses, for example, h one and a half. And, and so this is this is an open problem. And I, I I don't know actually if one can expect this connection or if there is a sort of a, a separate mechanism that would somehow equilibrate these roots um, and make them uh, more regularly spaced. And, and after that, maybe PE connection to PE may, may apply. So it's it's it's. I think it's it's the, the the very the very interesting question. Like if one could overcome this this constraint, then what could hope to really apply it to to uh, random polynomials, perhaps, and it would be very interesting. So second, the surprise is that the PDE that looks very nonlinear is a very efficient mixer and diffuser, right? So the estimates we have for it are basically like uh, a heat equation. And th that was also a little bit surprising for us. <clears throat> um, now, 
extending this to the real line would have to contend with free boundary problem because on the real line you can't expect to have uniformly positive bound from from below on the density for like natural at least initial data and so it's 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 again it's an interesting question if what and and, and what if it's possible to do something in that case I, I would think it should be possible but one needs to understand this potentially more singular behavior near near the free boundary mm -hmm. and so um, the connection that in the real line case there is this connection i mentioned with minor process for random matrices and its analog is not clear in the periodic setting basically for symmetric matrix you cut out a column you cut out of a, a row and and you still have a symmetric matrix and for unitary it doesn't work that way this is probably an analog some sort of rank one um, reductions that, that work for the unitary ones but I'm, I'm not aware if it has been done. <clears throat> and, and finally, so far, people are often thinking about sort of learning uh, about uh, various things with, with, with help of PDE. Like one natural question, if one could develop this technology to work for like random ensembles is, is the, the estimates for central limit theorem. Uh, the, the non-commutative central limit theorem, like Wigner's semicircle law, uh, one could conceivably try to use PDE to, to get better estimates there. But there is also a question of whether one can go back from these other approaches to PDE and learn something. In particular, the Hoskins Kabluchka formulas that apply for the evolution of this limiting law of, of polynomials. Um, like the limit n goes to infinity, uh, that doesn't use the PDE, they, they use sort of a different approach uh, involving inversion of, 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 of Stilchias, uh, Cauchy Stilchias transform. Um, this works for rougher solutions. So one could actually do it with delta functions. And the question is okay, can one go back? from that approach and learn something about very rough solutions for steiner bergs PDE. So I don't know, actually, maybe, maybe PDE is just not, not relevant for this, it does not apply for these solutions, or maybe there is a way to make sense of them. It's, it's a good question. That would be, of course, very rough solutions. So that's also an, an interesting question here. <clears throat> and so I think I will stop here and uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha, for your uh, very uh, nice talk. Uh, so is there any question from uh, the audience? It seems that no one has question. Uh, so I I have just a small question about do, do you think that uh, we can we can expect like uh, uniqueness uh, uh, for let's say uh, critical uh, in the critical setting because it's uh, or oh you mean for the for the rough rough initial yes. data yes yes that's a very good question yeah I mean. Uh, I don't know. You you probably know yeah. better than I do. <laughs> no, but I mean, but it's, it's you guess some. Uh, the critical. I mean, in the critical setting, I, in my experience, often you you, you still have uniqueness, but but as as you pass yeah. it, then then I I I wouldn't necessarily expect it. <clears throat> so yeah. So I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe this uh, part five is 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 exactly. Maybe a way to learn something about what, or at least to expect for the very last oh, okay. how to try to make sense of it. It's, it's actually an interesting question. Okay. Okay. But I, I think for me, it's sort of my main impression from this was um, I have a feeling that there is like a lot of structure behind this PDE and behind this connection that waits to be discovered. Because, like, all this global in time control of error comes from this form of error evolution that 
I don't really know why it, it has the main order. It's this heat equation, right? Yeah. So you can see where it comes from, sort of. But still, it was a surprising thing. So, so when I when I look at this, maybe I think maybe there is a way to use um, this complex form of the equation somehow, because it, it it feels like a little bit of magic and you know complex analysis. It, Definitely yeah. a magical thing, <laughs> but, but I don't know how to do that. Yes, okay, thanks. So still no question from the audience? So if not, so let's take uh, Sasha for this uh, nice talk. And uh, ah, maybe Peter Miller, he has a question. So let me, yes. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Uh, yes, yes, Peter. Yes. Great. Okay. Yes. Very nice talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sasha. Um, maybe I missed it, but is it is there a um, uh, is there a simple interpretation of the linearized version of the equation about equilibrium? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Um, you can maybe see the dissipation a lot better, or something like that, in that linearized. Limit. That, that, that's possible. So, so yeah. So if you if you like the dissipation, uh, yeah, you definitely will not have uh, this the degenerate thing. But yeah. So 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 I. Um, yeah. So I think linearization will be similar to this equation that that appears. here without you here mm. that, that's that's my guess that's probably going to be close to that um uh, but but yeah wait this is still not linear <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah so so i i i actually don't know why one will have to, to take a careful more careful look okay maybe it's a it, maybe it, there's a, a quick way to capture that exponential part of the decay that you're getting you know uh in the tail that's possible. Yeah, that's possible. But I mean, we start very far. We could start very far from it. Right? From sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but in your the result tail, is better, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the tail. Yeah, I I, I yeah. think there there should be a way. I think in the tail it should be very similar to just heat equation. Probably right. Yeah. But 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 getting there is is uh, yeah. It's not true. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, any other question or comments? Yes, Sasha. Yes, yes, I am. Hi. Let me ask you: uh, Do you think this question, uh, this equation, has any interesting invariants? Well, I'm not sure about invariants, but it certainly has interesting uh, controlled quantities. Right, so it has this maximum principle where it's it's contained between values it begins it, where it's initially, and there is also this um, observation of Roman that if you look at Hilbert transform divided by u, you derive the, the equation for that. It turns out to have maximum principle, and, and this equation has a maximum principle. So this means that this quantity is playing a role. Yeah, 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 and so so that lets you control Hilbert transform, which is very useful. Right? You don't you don't know a priori that Hilbert transform may be growing very large, but but that that lets you control Hilbert transform. So so yeah, so so there are definitely some nice properties, but yeah, but but I don't I don't expect conserved quantity because it's dissipative, right? So so it, it will no, it become no, better. Say. Not concerned, but invariant. So, in some sense, that you control in a better way, in a more direct way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's definitely the case. Yeah. So, so I think. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, and as I mentioned, we didn't use the the complex structure, but there is also a complex structure that. That maybe there is a way to use, but 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 we are working on the boundary, so things get difficult uh, on the boundary. You expect to have a little less control. <clears throat> okay. 
Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.